Welcome to snowy and cold weather. Thank you for coming here and bringing your warmth and heart to this session. You might have looked at the program and had different names in the program. And the funny thing is, this is a session on buildings, which tend to be quite stable unless there is a catastrophe. What is less stable are the presenters, because we have had quite some changes. One of our colleagues from Afghanistan couldn't come. Our colleague from Uganda obviously um, did not um, um, come due to flight difficulties. And what was nice, we still have an, uh, one stability here um, to my right hand side, sort of on the other way around, it's on the left hand. Uh, it's uh, from Norway. Uh, how, you do, how do you uh, pronounce your name best? It's Giannoumas. Giannoumas, oh, nice one. Um, and we have uh, all the way from Nepal, uh, and I, can I pronounce your name hopefully correctly, Deepak Sapkota? Yes. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, and my name is Johanna Mank. I'm from Light for the World, and I'm happy to chair this intense and short session today. It is about built environment in low income countries. And we have two presentations, which we will take uh, uh, right away, and then have questions and discussion session. So may I briefly um, introduce you? Um, and what, what I've just heard, you know, like the personal background is also important. His wife is coming from Vienna. <laughs> uh, and originally from the UA USA, now in, um, I think in Oslo, and uh, as an assistant professor for universal design in the Department of Computer Science at the Oslo Metropolitan University. Um, and I think it's a great uh, pleasure to have you here bringing in practice, research, uh, and um, getting us uh, to I think the latest standard and, and um, thoughts about uh, build environment and how to orient within environments in low-income country. So please take the floor for pr your presentation. Thank you very much. Do we have a clicker? Um, do we have a clicker? We are, these little technical problems. We are clickerless. We are clickerless. <laughs> ah, no, we are not. <laughs> All right, now we can start. Thank you so Please much. Anthony. <laughs> so, now let's see if the clicker will work. There we yes. go. Uh, the research and development work that I'm presenting is largely the result of an intersectoral collaboration between academia, civil society, and industry, and an international collaboration between the UK, Norway, and Spain. And I'm sure you're wondering right off the bat, what does this have to do with the Global South? And we're going to get to that, so I just ask you to be patient. Um, the network that we work in includes uh, my university, Oslo Metropolitan University, and it also includes organizations uh, led by and uh, consisting of persons with disabilities, uh, including the Royal Society for Blind Children, Il Union, and Blinde Forbundet in Norway, and that's the Norwegian Association of the Blind and Partially Sighted. And we also work with social startups, Wayfinder and Next Signal. The main idea behind uh, our network and the work that we're doing involves augmenting the physical environment using Internet of Things technologies. Now, Internet of Things, or IoT, is kind of a buzzword in the industry now, which just basically refers to any interconnected device that you might have. So this cup could be an IoT device if it was connected to the web and it told my doctor how often I drink water during the day and how much water I consume in the course of a week, just as an example. In the last year, IoT developers have really made some substantial strides in deploying indoor network navigation solutions. Now, these solutions use Bluetooth beacons, low-energy Bluetooth beacons and mobile applications. These beacons are about the size of a bottle cap. 
they're fairly low cost, and the costs of the beacons continue to go down as the industry uh, is scaling. Uh, right now, the cost is about 20 US dollars, around 20 euros per beacon, which I know in many cases is beyond the uh, financial reach of uh, organizations in low and middle income countries. But nonetheless, uh, this technology is fairly low cost compared to the other alternatives, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. So these te uh, Bluetooth technologies, these Bluetooth beacons enable persons with disabilities, in particular persons who are blind or partially sighted, to navigate complex indoor environments such as college and university campuses, hospitals, and similar. Even the United Nations. Because I remember the first time I came to this building, I said, actually, it's fairly difficult to find where I'm going, even with the number of signs that are available. So Bluetooth beacons used in conjunction with a mobile application on any kind of uh, phone can broadcast wayfinding information about the various elements in the built environment. For example, it could provide information about entrances and exits, directions to toilets, stairs, and other, any other point of interest. These technologies provide a more accurate, more precise, efficient, and low-cost investment for service providers when you compare it with really traditional forms of wayfinding, so personal assistance, uh, braille signs, tactile maps, or even GPS-enabled mobile phones, even regular signs. I want to be clear, this should not be seen as a substitute for these wayfinding, uh, um, wayfinding uh, information. It should be seen in, in uh, corollary with it. It should be seen as complementary to it. So these technologies are currently in development throughout Europe, including London, Oslo, Barcelona, and Budapest. And we've also done some experiments in the US and Australia. The project is really innovative because Bluetooth beacons have the potential to augment the built environment using multimodal instructions. So for persons with visual impairments, Bluetooth beacons can provide content that is accessible for screen readers. For persons who may be deaf or hard of hearing, the same content can be provided via text or sign language videos. For persons with mobility impairments, the system can provide instructions to navigate using the most accessible routes. And for persons with print disabilities or low literacy, the content can be provided in easy to read formats and in different languages. Since the content is easy to update via an online interface, it can be updated in real time to include things like safety notices, outages, or repair work. So rather than what we have, system that we have today, which is just assigned to a room, we, and then we have to take it down if the room is being renovated or if there's a, a problem with the route getting to the room or put up some other secondary notice that may not be accessible at all, this uh, information can be updated uh, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis with the status of any kind of environment. So while well, tech, these technologies are absolutely necessary for some, they are good for everyone, and they really have the potential to ensure uh, what we call a truly universally designed world. Now, as I've mentioned, we've begun experimenting with these technologies in the global north. But the real impact of these technologies can actually enable countries in the global south to leapfrog existing indoor navigation solutions. So one of our goals in the coming year is to adapt these solutions to the local social and cultural requirements and experiences of people and persons with disabilities in the global south. We're going to do this by developing new software applications in collaboration with end user communities. It obviously does us no good to try to roll out a system like this in the global south and offer it only on iOS. It can do some good if we're able to offer it on different platforms and even create applications for feature phones that enable people across the income spectrum to be able to afford and use this technology. Our ultimate aim is not to transplant ideas and technologies from the global north to the global south, but to ensure that bi-directional technology transfer enables the experiences that we gain in the Global South to better inform how we implement these technologies around the world. And this is really important because one of the, work, one of the projects that we're currently working on is implementing this system in Mozambique. 
And I tell the students uh, who are collaborators in this project that if you can make it work in Mozambique, then you can absolutely make it work in any resource-constrained environment in Norway, in Europe, in the United States, or anywhere else in the world. Resource constraints are kind of agnostic when it comes to the uh, n nation and social and cultural uh, paradigm that they exist in. Uh, a company that is unwilling to spend money on accessibility or a, a company that owns buildings and is unwilling to retrofit their buildings for, uh, for accessibility because of uh, undue burden or cost or whatever it is, if we learn how to create this technology in a way that's accessible and usable and available to people in the global south, there's no reason why we can't make it also available to people here in the global north. These technologies also have the potential to generate new entrepreneurial opportunities aimed at implementing the Bluetooth beacons in new industries and for creating new value-added services that take advantage of existing Bluetooth beacon infrastructure. And basically what that means is if we can put the infrastructure in place in any given building, it can be uh, repurposed in a number of different ways without uh, imp impacting the accessibility features that it already has. So, we recently concluded a study of the usability of these technologies with approximately 50 persons that identify as blind or partially sighted. The data showed that overall persons with disabilities considered the technology to be highly usable. Participants commented that they had a good experience, quote unquote, that the technology was, quote, easy to understand and follow, and that it was, quote, exciting to experience this new kind of technology. Another participant commented that the system enabled them to, quote, safely negotiate the stairs, and that, quote, the instructions were clear and made me able to get from A to B. However, participants also commented uh, on some uh, improvements for the system, and they basically focused on the timing of the notifications. So we've been engaging in uh, some continued research and development to ensure that the timing of the notifications are absolutely optimal for people with vision impairments. Last thing I want to feature is that uh, we've uh, been contributing, myself and the constellation of actors that are participating in developing this technology, we've contributed to a recent UN publication uh, from the International Telecommunications Union. This is a formal recommendation for audio-based network navigation systems for persons with vision impairments. It basically provides guidance for any technology developers or building owners to implement this technology in a way that's going to ensure that it's usable for persons with vision impairments and it's freely available online. We still got a long way to go before this technology is fully usable and accessible for everyone, especially for persons with disabilities. And in particular, the cost of the hardware must continue to come down as hardware manufacturers reach economies of scale. As I mentioned, we're aiming to pilot the first, in pilot the first installations of this technology at the University of Edward Monlane in Mozambique, this is ultimately an infrastructure project that provides the opportunity to create buildings that are accessible for persons with disabilities, but it's an infrastructure project that's fed from the bottom up. The promise is there. What we need to do to take the next step is for ICT developers and engineers, designers, architects, maintenance staff, disabled people's organizations, and urban planners to work together to realize the promise and potential that this technology has for persons with disabilities throughout the world. Thank you very much for uh, providing us this input and I particularly find it interesting to see this development from bringing it into other countries and what you said in terms of really developing in then with the end user communities in Mozambique and piloting about it and look at the costs so that low income uh, countries and persons with disabilities in these countries can use it. And I'm sure there will be several questions about it um, following the second presentation. And now we will make a jump from Norway, Mozambique towards Nepal. Um, and um, Deepak Sapkota uh, will 
talk about, and first of all, I have to introduce you. Um, he's the director of the Karuna Foundation. He will tell us what the Karuna Foundation is about. He has a long background uh, being also uh, at the board of the Associated uh, international um, NGOs on the board of the child welfare. Uh, so a good background in uh, childhood disability prevention, uh, community-based rehabilitation, and a very holistic approach um, to inclusion and people with disability. So may I ask you for, present your, yes. for your presentation? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank, you very, thank you very, very much for this opportunity. I was presenting yesterday also, so some of the slides are the repetition of yesterday, so those who were attending the session yesterday. And I think it's a quite contrast from global north to complete global south. So very brief introduction of Corona. Corona was established in 2007 as an international NGO, and our aim was to prevent childhood disability, that is birth defects, and developing disabilities in the later stage, specifically with children. And then community-based rehabilitation, so how we can provide better quality life to the children and adults with disabilities, but also families, because without families it is not very easy to make a rich. And then the most important part that we try to do is to strengthen local communities, basically municipalities, so that, so that they can take it over when we exit. So collaboration was with municipalities and local government is key from the very beginning. And now since 2016, we have, we have been operating as a national NGO of Nepal. Basically the essence of what we are doing is, you know, people with disabilities and their families are in lead. They are taking the whole initiation movement by their own uh, leader, in their own leadership. The local government is very proactive and they are trying their level best to incorporate the issue of disability and, and health. Accessible and also affordable the primary health care services so that disability can be prevented and when people with disabilities need any kind of medical interventions they can approach to these services. And focused on making enabling environment in, including accessibility. So when we talk about uh, accessibility and, and accessible environment, it's not only uh, structures, you know, it's not only technology, it's more about mindset, the mentality, how family thinks, whether the family members are ready to take the child or the adult person of the dis with disability to social activities or not, to other economic activities or not. So this is also a very much focus. Normally in our program, we see sustainability from three different perspectives. There has to be a structure in place to make things continue, make things happen. So we invest quite good time of uh, good time and resources in terms of building capacity of municipalities and local other structures. Obviously we need money and that has to be generated within their own self because the problem of people of Nepal is problem of people of Nepal and government of Nepal people from around the globe. We can support, we can be part of that process, but we cannot take it over. So there has to be, the government of Nepal and people of Nepal has to come forward. And by the end of the day, quality. I think that if we talk about quality of services in comparison to Nepal and Austria or in, in Norway, we cannot compare, you know, quality is different because of the poverty, because of mindset, because of so many things. So we focus on structure, then money, and then quality. Then in terms of disability, I think the biggest challenge that we have faced is data. We do not have number, we do not know where they live, and we do not know what sort of disabilities they do have. Because in, in, in Nepal, disabilities has been classified in 10 different groups. So, Could you come to the building? yes. And then cost sharing of, by the local, local system and using technology Basically, in, uh, that is mobile health and other issues are, are there. What so some, some other impact that, that has been created by the program, but most import importantly is, is you know, these uh, structures. How we can make it accessible. For example, this is a 12 years old girl with cerebral palsy, isolated and in a lugged in, in a room because 
everything was not, nothing was possible for her. With a very minor kind of interventions, we modified, we helped the family to modify her, her house, at least uh, make uh, accessible to, to the toilet, to her dining hall and to, to the bedroom with very low cost and things, things, things happen perfectly. You know? And then now this girl, is, you know, her, her, she is very fond of it and she says, wheels are my wings. Though it's in the mountain, she cannot travel more than 200 meters within, within her house, even not 200 meters. It, it is steepy mountains, but things are changing significantly. In terms of uh, you know, accessibility and creating enabling environment, in, in last in year 2017, we were working with 4,917 people with disabilities. They had easy access because of modification like ramp, accessible toilets. The schools were basically ECD, early childhood development centers and primary schools were modified. The teachers were trained. Peer education was part of the part of the process so that they can easily accept a child with disability next to them. So schools were more inclusive. Public toilets, one of the biggest challenges of Nepal is, you know, when a even a person with wheelchair user in, in wheelchair can travel, you know, let's say 20 kilometers, they stop drinking, they stop eating because they do not know where is the toilet. So, so, you know, a lot of activities are restricted. And then when they sleep in the hotel, they cannot go to the first floor because there are no lifts. You know, somebody has to carry them in, in a very, very pathetic manner. So, so public toilets are very, very important part of, 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 of this uh, accessibility. And then daycare centers and other various like home modifications as an example, we have been pretty successful on, on those kind of things. And then once again, I would like to say, you know, enabling environment. Changing mindset of people with, with some local solutions are very, very much effective in, in many ways. So another example, you know, this, this lady was all, you know, bedridden and with a very tiny help of walker and little bit modification around her house. She can walk now. She can do some basic work. She doesn't need any help from somebody else. So accessibility has, has to, again, has to be considered from different point, point of view. And most importantly, they can do some, 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 sort of, some sort of work that can economically help families to, 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 to be little freed. And challenges also we do have, like, in, again, data is a huge challenge. Geography, in, in case of Nepal, we, we have steepy mountains and you know, high hills. So the, the mountain of Austria is only the hills for us. So, you know, that makes big, big, big challenge. Mindset, people are still considering, you know, everything is, is, is done from charity-based approach, technical human resource, and even miles more to go. I ha I'm almost done. So we are now in the phase of expansion in Nepal, which is not very important. I will, mm -hmm. accessible environment means like that welcomes everybody. That does not in exclude anybody. Inaccessible one restricts many, including people with disabilities. So it's our choice. If we invest from the day first in our infrastructures, in our thinking, in our technology to include everybody, that is easily okay for everybody. But if they restrict people with disability, wheelchair users, then it is restricted for many people. Limiting people at home means loss of economy. 8% GDP, according to the survey, you know, is not gained by countries because they are not being utilized, the, the human resources. Also, it's undignified, and also, in, most importantly, it's inhuman. So I think if we agree from today that you know, whenever we go back to our place, we change at least one setting, make it accessible, I think that will help significantly. Now I have one, one minute, a video of, of a minute. From completely different perspective, let, let's watch it. Kusiko 
So, 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 uh, this is. Okay. So, this is it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. I think these two presentations complement each other quite well. It uh, reminds us that we do need the technical solution. And it also reminds us that how important community based rehabilitation with the processes and the bigger picture of enabling environment is so that we really get to an accessible uh, environment and world where everybody gets access to everything and to everybody. So, having said this, I'm looking around and we are taking a few questions and comments. I would like, please raise your hand, who wants to speak up? Yes, please. Yes, hi, I'm Murtaza Khan from Bangladesh. Um, I had a question um, about um, emergency situations and if there's any good solutions in terms of uh, evacuation uh, and designing for that uh, for people with disabilities, especially in, say, multi-storied uh, buildings. Thank you very much. We will ask the others, and I know that there is a session right after this session here in this room about humanitarian aid. So I please ask you to stay on um, for this session as well. Any other comments or questions? Um, if not, then I ask the two about the humanitarian, and I have a question uh, back to the Mozambique case. How far are you in the pilot uh, phase? I mean, and how did you link up with the university, and do you start with one university there, and then you move into other um, buildings, or how is this uh, envisaged to sort of develop? Do you want to talk about um, uh, humanitarian sort of uh, aid and if what's happening in Nepal? I do not have much idea, but what we have done after 2015 earthquake of Nepal is, you know, that we have identified a couple of public places, open spaces in, in Kathmandu and in other, other cities, and some basic infrastructures like uh, inclusive accessible toilets and shelters kind of uh, construction, you know, this prefab construction has been, has been started. We have started to make it together with government. It's basically government initiation. And uh, rescue, especially in case of emergency situation in mountains is always huge challenge. But what we experienced in 2015 earthquake, you know, this mobile phone, telephone is, is emerging as a blessing. Despite of being able to reach the, uh, in, in two days, you know, the phone, luckily phone was functioning and then people could contact and tell what exactly the situation and then helicopter could fly. So that was our brief experience of Nepal of 2015, massive earthquake. Thank you very much. And you might have also this about the question about high-rise buildings and evacuation out of these uh, buildings. Sure, I'm really happy that you brought up the issue of emergency preparedness and emergency situations for, in this regard. Um, I, I, I struggle for a, a kind of a single solution here. I think the best possible solution is just to go back to the mantra, uh, nothing about us without us, uh, and ensure that people with disabilities have uh, substantive involvement in any kind of emergency preparedness plans and any kind of emergency preparedness policies so that they can uh, work with governments, building owners, to ensure that the, uh, what they're putting into practice is going to be accessible for everyone. Um, I just want to point out that emergency situations uh, are, are extraordinarily uh, critical, not only for people with disabilities, but for people who experience situational disabilities at that moment of crisis. Um, if there is a, anything from a fire to a, uh, you know, a mass shooter, people's stress response kind of goes out of control and it's very easy to experience a what we call a situational disability where your senses and your cognition and even your physical body uh, may not uh, may experience barriers to kind of operating the way that you expect it to um, and 
in terms of technology, uh, obviously the Bluetooth beacon technology provides a, a useful approach to kind of dealing with emergency situations for people with disabilities. But I want to point out also that a lot of times communications platforms are the first thing people turn to in emergency situations. Uh, I think the clearest and easiest example was the recent uh, school shooting in the U.S. in Florida where students took to Twitter almost immediately during the uh, uh, shooting event and people who uh, were on the other side of the country and on the other side of the world who had also experienced shooting events were able to respond to them and give them advice and guidance in that act, during that act. That's an incredible resource. And we have to make sure that these communications platforms are accessible for everyone, uh, including people with disabilities, uh, both in terms of the uh, compatibility with any kind of assistive technology, but also in terms of ease of use for people who experience, who, um, experience barriers using technology due to cognition or uh, anything else. Um, to answer your question about the, how far are we in the pilot phase, we're still in the conceptualization phase, so we basically have uh, some interesting uh, opportunities to develop some pilot projects uh, and to some prototype some software applications. Uh, we originally linked up with the University of Edward Monlane through a um, collaboration grant provided by the Norwegian government, and we were very grateful to them for this opportunity. It's a five-year grant uh, to continue to collaborate in any area related to universal design of technology, and I think this is just a brilliant way of building infrastructure and building capacity. Uh, how will we scale to other buildings and other areas? Uh, our hope is to get the pilot finished first. I think if we can provide some very clear evidence on how well this technology works, that can help drive adoption. And again, by working with communities of practice in these regions and local communities, I think that can also drive adoption as well. Um, many things. I'm looking around. Are there other comments and questions? I think we can take one more. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. So my name is Carsten Gareis from Empirica in Bonn, Germany. Um, just one general question. Uh, obviously, um, smartphone technology, I mean, I think it's also very widespread in Mozambique and in Nepal these days. Uh, and um, smartphones are heavily used by people uh, in the more developed countries uh, yeah, for um, overcoming um, accessibility obstacles. So to what extent are they used then in your um, communities or in, in the country you're working in uh, then also by uh, these, this clientele? So uh, do they um, already have found ways to, to make use of this uh, infrastructure for their own ends? That would be interesting to know. Thank you. Sure, so I can respond first. So the a mobile penetration rate, especially for smartphones in uh, Mozambique, is actually higher than uh, I ever anticipated, which was, is really brilliant. And it's, uh, it's kind of slated to continue to uh, you know, immerse the market, which is fantastic. It really helps us leverage this technology in the most effective way possible. That being said, there are certainly low-income communities that don't have access to this technology and who may not have access to the technology for, for many more years. And so we're, in taking a, uni a truly universally designed approach, we are doing everything we can to ensure that the technology that we're deploying is going to be cross-platform compatible. So whether that's a person that owns a, the latest uh, iPhone X, or whether that's someone that owns a Nokia phone from the 1980s. Uh, we're trying to make sure that all these technologies are universally accessible. Thank you very much. May I also ask you yeah, to answer? I think I have, I have not much to say, but in case of Nepal also, the use of mobile phone is, is increasing rapidly. Almost 70% plus population is using mobile phone, even in case where there is no connectivity. They are using it for watching video or movie or song or, you know, kind of thing. So, so I think the trend is growing and we can use that. Up, it is an opportunity to make more rich, number one. Number two, what I would like to say, in, in Karuna's web, OEPs, there are lots of awareness uh, uh, like packages, videos and other information like the video that you have seen and if you would like to use that for your own purpose in your country, please uh, do use it uh, if that, that, that can help. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, we need to wrap up, uh, wrap up this session.
Uh, I would like to thank both speakers, bringing us in such a short time key elements of accessibility from technology, enabling environment, working with the communities, nothing about us without us. Um, the way forward, um, mentioning also really technology that is used and can be handled by everybody and taking a step-by-step -step approach and never forget the social uh, aspects and components. Uh, I would like to rem or, or remind you if you are interested in the two case studies which were not presented, uh, because the two presenters were not able to come, uh, they are in the pack. It's the Afghanistan uh, example about accessible schools, and it's about Uganda, um, about uh, the Ministry for Works and Transportation. Again, two really uh, incredible examples. You might want to read it up and look it up. So thank you for your participation. I can advise to stay on for the humanitarian part. As we know, that is really important and affects all of us when things happen and things do happen. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.